Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Captain Eddie has just given you a demonstration that I'm pretty sure you will not see anywhere else. So uh, thank you to the crew, to the ground crew who cleared the area, the CAP cadets. My name is Connie Bolin, and I'm the founder of Warbirds in Review. And you never know what you're going to find at Warbirds in Review, EA Oshkosh. So welcome to everyone, and I'm here to say thank you to the people who make this possible, not only the aircraft owners and all the volunteers who make this happen, but to Scott's miracle Grow Company, who give us the funding, the sponsorship, to Ron and Diane Fagan, who are huge supporters of everything we do here at Warbirds in this beautiful building behind us. I would like to now uh, ask you to... Uh, take your attention to the jumbotron behind this beautiful airplane to learn a little bit more about the Firefly before Captain Eddie and the, some of the crew come out to the, talk about this beautiful airplane. Please, to the jumbotron. This is a nifty looking airplane, but what is it? It looks something like some other military planes, especially the P-51 Mustang, but look more closely and you realize its design is all its own. We see lots of Mustangs, B-17s, and C-47s. Corsairs and Avengers. But very few of these for good reason. Only three of them are flying in the world and only one of them, one of the two you are looking at, is at home in the United States. Say hello to the British Ferry Aviation Company Firefly. Two cockpits, big prop a tail dragger with folding wings. It was carrier-based British Royal Navy and later flown by Australia, Canada, and the Dutch. The Firefly saw its first combat in World War II, July 1944, launched from the British aircraft carrier Indefatigable off the coast of Norway, which was under German control. It attacked the German battleship Tirpitz and other enemy ships in Norwegian waters. It was a reconnaissance day-night fighter and anti-submarine aircraft. So much of what we see on screens about World War II in the Pacific is about American forces. One of the best known was Victory at Sea on NBC with powerful, haunting music by Richard Rogers. Battleships, aircraft carriers, the Battle of Midway, Marines and Army soldiers being slaughtered in attacks on Japanese controlled islands day after day, month after month, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and many more. What is less known is that the British and Australian navies joined American fleets fighting the Japanese. One of their key weapons was the Firefly that attacked Sumatra, Japanese-controlled Formosa, now Taiwan, Truck Lagoon, and the home islands of Japan. Years later, Fireflies attacked North Korea in that horrible war. More than 1,700 fireflies of various designs were built. It was the British Navy's most capable two-seat fighter of World War II. 
Restoring iconic military aircraft requires vast amounts of time, uh, money, and effort. Thousands of men and women, young and not so young, continue to volunteer to restore and maintain vintage aircraft so that all of us will never forget the people who designed, built, and flew these planes. Too many of them died so that each of us can continue to live free and enjoy the privileges of freedom. One of those who has worked for years to restore Great Plains is Eddie Kurdzeel. He's a retired naval aviator, flew the A-4, the F-8 Crusader, the A-7 Corsair, and the S-3 Viking. As a civilian, he's been a Delta captain for decades. The Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's collection of more than 40 aircraft began with the purchase of the Ferry Firefly in 1979. The museum maintains and preserves Canada's aviation history as it continues to restore aircraft that are both great pieces of workmanship and airworthy. Come on, guys. You take those two far seats, OK? <clears throat> Good afternoon, folks. On my left here is Eddie Kurtzeel. He's the owner of this aircraft. And it's, this is the EA Grand Champion of 2002. Next to, next to him is Steve McIntosh, and he's from the Canadian Warplane Museum in Hamilton, Ontario. And next to him is Andy Dobson. Steve is a, he's a pilot also, and he's flown a, a lot of different airplanes that they have in the museum, including the Firefly. Andy is, he's a, also from the museum. He's an active airline pilot, 787. He was retired from the uh, RCAF, and uh, he's currently, they're not, don't have their airplane here. It's, it, they're having maintenance issues right now, but they hope to have it next year. First of all, Eddie, uh, what's the mission purpose of this airplane? Why was it designed? Uh, the airplane was designed as a long-range reconnaissance fighter. So a lot of people think it's a torpedo plane. That people, my friends, that beat me up over this, but it, it really is a long-range fighter. So if, if you look at the airplane when it was originally designed, it was a Mark One and Mark Two. This is a Mark Five. So there's a four, five, and six. They look about the same. And the right, the way this airplane is, the right pod was a radar, and so the guy in the back ran the radar and was also a navigator. So they did long range reconnaissance, long flights over the water. So that's what the guy in the back did. Everybody asked if he was a gunner, he never was. And the airplane is really quite maneuverable. In fact, it has, a, I ran the flaps through for you, that first position that you see, which is called cruise, the flaps come out like a biplane, parallel to the wings of the airplane even shot down a bunch of Oscars on the way to Japan. So that's what the airplane was designed as. And then as it aged, they turned it into a, ground attack airplane, and that's what you see right here. And this is the way the airplane was painted when it was in Korea, and then it became an anti-submarine warfare aircraft after that, and it got replaced by, the US was using the TBM at the time, and the Brits ended up using the Ferry Gannett, and if you guys have been coming to Oshkosh for a long time, and that's a turbine thing with the, it's another Ferry product, which is a really weird, you know, the wings fold up and everything. Now, out of 1,702, Produced, how many are still flying? There are two right now. It's uh, this this airplane and the Canadian Warplane Heritage Airplane. And, and yours is close to being flying, is that correct? Okay, well, tell us about the restoration process of your airplane, uh, where you got it, and uh, you don't have to tell us the money. But, uh, and then, you know, the specifications and how's it configured now, and also the paint scheme. Um, this airplane, I originally saw a picture of this. I don't want to date myself, but 
it was in Flying Magazine. It was March or April of 1974. And I just remember it on the cover. And, and I mean, it was the coolest thing ever. I go, that was a really cool airplane. And that was a Canadian airplane. And that came here to Oshkosh. And I don't remember ever seeing it fly, but I actually saw the Royal Navy had an airplane in their historic flight that flew in England. And I saw that airplane fly, but that airplane crashed. And uh, both guys were tragically killed. And those were flown by the reserves. This airplane was sold at auction in 1965. It, so what happened was this airplane served in the Royal Australian Navy. It was delivered in 1950. And I have a little signboard. You guys can come out afterwards and take a look at it. And then airplane flew until I think 56 or 57. Then they converted the airplane into a target towing airplane. So it had a tow package on the bottom of it. The only thing I left on the airplane that's that's from that era, there's like a little chute on the back, and that's where they used to push the banner out. And that was towed 3,000 feet behind this airplane, and the ships would shoot at it. So, yeah, it was, it was a, guys told me that the guns were radar guided, and sometimes they'd lock onto the wire and start climbing their way up towards the airplane. So then that airplane, as a target tug, was operated by a private company called Brown and Brain. And they sold the airplanes at auction in 1965. The t a town called Griffith, New South Wales, which is like four hours west of Sydney. It's in a very agricultural area. It's kind of like Bakersfield, so it's really hot and dry. They bought the airplane for $400. They got somebody to donate the fuel. They flew the airplane to Griffith, and they put it up on a pole, and it stayed up there for like 40 years. And so it was just a big birdhouse. There was another Firefly flying in Australia that a guy had restored, and that airplane crashed. And so when it crashed, it broke its back. And they said, well, we can't restore it. It's going to cost too much money. So the people that I got the airplane from, I saw an ad in trade a plane. You guys shouldn't read that newspaper, as you know. And it's 60% restored Firefly, right? That's what it said. I said, oh, this would be so cool to have this. And I'll just, I'll just get it to fly. And so basically, they were the ones that negotiated with the town for two years to take it off the pole. And the town said, well, you can't take all of it because it's a historic landmark. This airplane flew in Korea, you know, so you can have the body, but you can't take the wings or the tail. So this is the wings and the tail off of 828 and the body off of the one that was on the pole. We figured, well, the serial number follows WB518, and that's the airplane that was on the pole. And the wings and the tail are actually, I don't even know if they're off of 828. We don't know what they came from because if you look at the serial numbers and the dates, one wing is 1951, the other wing is 1948. The tail is 1946. So I think any time the airplanes came aboard ship and they were damaged, they would just take parts out of stores and just repair the airplane. So we figured the serial number follows the fuselage. So this is WB518. And so this is 45,000 man hours restoration. It, it, it was restored from, I bought the airplane in 94. I first saw it in trade plane in 1993. And out here in the audience, I have to recognize a guy because it's, I'm just Jacques' custodian, and out here in the audience is Tim Freeze. Tim, if you'll stand up. He started when he was like 12 working on this thing. And I won't tell you how old he is now, but he's the one that basically built this whole airplane and QG Aviation of America out in Fort Collins in Colorado. So that's, that's who did the airplane, and, and that's what you see now. Okay, how about the paint job? Paint job. Uh, was What's done it, by Ron Maley. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Represents Korea. This is exactly how this airplane was painted. It was the CO of the squadron's airplane. So with the blue spinner, that's the significance of the blue spinner. The rest of the airplanes had gray. One of the other squadron, you know, so you could always identify the CO. They may have had a red spinner or something like that. So, But that's, that's what this, this is exactly the way it was painted in Korea. And you have to remember it's a ground attack airplane. So this carried either two 1,000-pound bombs or 16... 60 pound warhead rockets that were you can see underneath where they mount just about underneath the guns and the guns are uh four hispano mark 5 20 millimeter cannons now and the other variants it was a torpedo bomber no never it never it was wasn't? a torpedo bomber i said what? that's what my friends give me a hard oh, time about but no it's no, so it's, that was the armament right there that that's you just that's mentioned. the armament that's correct well how does the airplane fly i mean you got a lot of time in it i mean yeah i've got about almost 400 hours in the airplane it is, I mean, it's a big machine. It's like what you see. I mean, all up gross weight is 16,100 pounds. So if you look at a, you guys are familiar with PC-12s. A PC-12 fully loaded weighs what this does empty. 
So, I mean, it's a, it's a big airplane, and you do not want to get the airplane slow. I mean, it flies kind of like an underpowered jet. That's what I, you, you know, if you come through the 90, you're doing maybe 120 knots and slow. They brought it aboard the ship in the 90s, 90 knots, you know, 92, 93 knots when it came aboard ship. The problem with that is you're, you're kind of on the backside of the power curve. And, and if you look at the prop, it turns the wrong way. So it's a ton of left rudder, and I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable when you're bringing the throttle up. So I typically wheel land the airplane, and uh, it's with the maneuvering flaps down, like I showed you, the cruise flaps, when they're in that position, the airplane could outturn the zero. And the airplane was tested at Pax River. They brought all kinds of allied airplanes back at the end of the war, and there's a bunch of test reports that I found, and it described the whole airplane and, and how well the thing maneuvered. So, What kind of range do you have in it? Um, with the drop tanks that are on here now, the lowest you can get the fuel burn down to in U.S. gallons, because it's all Imperials, just under two gallons a minute. If you're flying an air show, about four gallons a minute. So once the drop tanks are gone, the main fuel gauge, they feed immediately into the main tank. You don't really have a quantity indication for the drop tanks, but when it starts burning out of the main tank, the main tank fuel gauge is just like a clock. So, I mean... <laughs> it has gallons, and you go, that's how many minutes I have left. And well, it's when like, you're across country, what are you? Yeah, about two hours. So, you know, 400 miles, it's a bit 200, 220 knots. We did coming out here. Uh, that's flying at max range, which is 160 knots indicated. I mean, in level flight, you can do, without the tanks, probably 330, 330 indicated to be top speed. And then going downhill, red line's 380 knots. Well, any particular quirks about it? It's a pretty honest airplane. It's just a big machine. I mean, that's the one thing you have to realize. It's heavy. The you know the wings are pretty heavily loaded. And for a fighter, you know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, it does aerobatics and everything, but you just don't want to get slow in it. I yeah. think that's that's what killed the Royal Navy airplane and uh, the two guys that were in it at an air show. So, Steve, what tell us a little bit about your museum, a little history of your museum. Well, it was started by uh, Dennis Bradley and uh, a few others. Uh, back in 71, I think, but the first airplane was a Firefly. And I think the original intention was to use it as a, a racer for Reno. And it was soon discovered it wasn't really, wasn't really practical to do that. But they started collecting more airplanes. Uh, they got a, a Harvard, a Chipmunk, and uh, a few other airplanes started to add. Uh, but by the 80s, it was a fairly going concern, and we, we had... Uh, uh, acquired a, a Lancaster, which is now the queen of our fleet. Uh, I think it first flew uh, back in 1989. And uh, we continue to add more airplanes, so it, it's, uh, it's actually more of a world-class museum now. How about the history of the air, airplane, the Firefly that you have up there you're working on now? Well, the original aircraft that started the Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton was a Firefly. Unfortunately, it was lost in 1977 at uh, Toronto International Air Show. But in 1979, we were able to acquire in Australia another Mark VI Firefly and uh, brought that back to Canada. It had a long-term restoration project out in Victoria, British Columbia, and finally got back to the museum almost 20 years after the original one was lost in 1997. It is a Mark VI, but Canada never used Mark VI's, so it's painted as a Mark V that was flown out of Shearwater and on the uh, HMCS Magnificent Carrier. Now, now, all of you have, have, have flown lots of other warbirds. How would you compare this to other warbirds you've flown, particularly the museum? And, and also for you, Eddie. Well, I'll back up what Eddie said, that the feel of it is more like a straight-wing jet than it is almost any other piston airplane I've flown, only with tons of torque. Um, it is very honest, it's powerful, it's fast, and the, the most remarkable feature I find is how well harmonized the controls are, the roll rate, the pitch rate, the forces, everything works just beautifully with each other. How, well, any, any of you, how well, how well did it fulfill its mission requirements? It did a really good job with mission requirements just by the length of time that it remained in service. Because, I mean, there are very few airplanes that stayed in service for, 
know, this airplane was designed in 39. I first flew in 41. First combat mission was 44. And you figure it operated until 65. Yeah. I mean, that is a long time. And, it's, and they, they made some of them into drones, too. So they were remotely piloted, and they shot those down with uh, meteors and stuff like that with the, to try out missiles and different armament. Was well, there any particular reason that the, the cockpits are so far separated? I don't know. There's a fuel tank in between, and, okay, nobody, well, and nobody likes that. <laughs> yeah. You got a little flying bomb there, I guess. Well, what do you, what do you guys get out of flying this around the, the country and showing it to the different people personally? You know, when I first finished the restoration, I mean, it was it was eight years. I mean, it was a really, it was a tough road to hoe. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I think I'm kind of dyslexic. So when I look at a project, I kind of imagine what it looks like in the end and then kind of work backwards to figure out how I'm going to do it. You know, otherwise I would never do it. You know, you start at step one and go step 300,000 something. I mean, you just, it's just overwhelming. And I think because I've flown fighters and all this stuff before, you know, the airplane was kind of underwhelming when I flew it the first time, and I was just relieved that it was just done. You know, I mean, I was just like so happy. The project was finished. I'm just, I can't take any more. It's just a too hard. And people go, well, that's pretty anticlimactic. And I'd say maybe seven or eight years into flying it, all of a sudden I realized, you know, what I got to do. And it's just an absolute privilege because, I mean, if this thing could just talk, I mean, it's, when you're alone with it in the hangar, cleaning it off or something at the end of, you know, flying it, it's it's basically 40 hours of my time for every flight hour. And that's not the mechanics, that's just me. I mean, that's to put it away, to clean it, to keep it, to make it look the way it does, to pre-flight it, to get ready to go on an air show some places, takes probably two days. And somebody said, well, what don't you get? When these airplanes were in service, 100 people took care of three of them. And I keep waiting for the other 30-some guys to show up, but they... They haven't showed up yet. So, you know, it's it's just an overwhelming amount of work. I mean, just even to bring this here, it was 15 hours a day. Tim and I worked, you know, and it just and it's just you think it's going to be easy. It just doesn't happen that way. But flying it, you know, the airplane really belongs to all of you guys. And it's, I have to recognize all the Australians that are out here that have come from halfway around the world to see this. In fact, we have... Um, uh, Air Marshal is out here, too, from the Royal Australian Air Force, and I know he's not a Navy guy, but we'll, we'll accept him. But, it's, but, you know, the airplane is really important to a lot of people, and I understand that, you know, I'm just, the more you fly it, to realize it's never going to be yours. You know what I mean? I paid a lot of money to be Jacques' custodian, like I said, and it's, and it's, you just get to take care of it and pay for it, and then hopefully it'll go on to somebody else. You know How about I mean? you, Andy? I can only echo what Captain Eddie has said, that uh, it's such a privilege to be able to keep that history alive and to show it to new generations uh, of people to invoke that memory of the sacrifices made by those who went before us, who used them operationally, instead of us uh, doing it when the sun's shining and uh, everyone's happy. So you feel yourself lucky to be able to, to to fly it. Oh, it's an incredible privilege to be able to fly an aircraft like that. Uh, not only for the rarity, also for the joy of flying it, and also to participate in the museum activities with it. How about you, Steve? Well, my initial impression was that it would look like it would be something really cool to fly. <laughs> but uh, certainly I have a strong feeling for the historical aspect of it, but I remember taking it to a show near Ottawa and finally, I met a veteran who had flown them, and it was a very emotional experience for him. So that that's kind of sticks in my mind. Yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to meet a lot of veterans. I met a Dutch guy that flew with these in Indonesia, and his description of this in combat was unbelievable. I mean, he said, oh, it was just magnificent when they came in for the strafing runs on the guys that were fighting in Indonesia. He said, you know, the Hawker Hunters would come in and drop bombs, and then the Firefly would come in and strafe them, and he said, this she is beautiful, he said, and this is absolutely magnificent. I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> and there was another guy we tried to bring him this year. As one of the, uh, he was a test pilot. He went on to become the tornado test pilot and the typhoon test pilot, and he was involved in a midair with these 
when he went to Australia, 21 years of age, they decided to go on an exchange with the Royal Australian Navy. And he and his best friend went down there. And his best friend did a head-on pass on a flight of three when they were up doing navigator training and hit his airplane. And he said there was a big thump when he went by. He said he looked out, and seven feet of his wing was gone. And you know, you talk to these guys, and they're the ones that actually flew it. There's just very, very few people left that actually operated the airplane. And I, you guys all saw bridges over Toko Re with Mickey Rooney and the helicopter and all that stuff. That was about a Firefly crew that was shot down in Korea and was rescued by uh, the Navy crew that came and picked them up because they had a Sikorsky helicopter stationed on board uh, HMS Sydney. And, uh, and Hank, I got to meet the guy that was in the back seat, was still alive. And he escaped the North Koreans and it was the U.S. helicopter that picked him up. And so the whole thing in the movie was about, actually about a firefly that was shot down in Korea. Okay, we've got, uh, have you got anything else that you'd like to add right now? We're going to have question and answer. Go, no, go, go ahead. How about some Q&A? I've got to get my mics out here. It's a Griffin. So this is the largest V12 that Rolls-Royce ever built. It's 1,000 cubic inches bigger than the Merlin, 38 liters of swept volume, uh, stock horsepower is 2450. And the way it's restored, if we had 150 octane fuel, which we don't have, probably 3,000, we've got 58 heads and banks on. So it's only an estimate. We don't have it, haven't been able to run it at that. Does it have a TBO or, or not? I wish it had a TBO, <laughs> but like halfway through life, you know, I think if you really take care of it, maybe 800 hours, maybe, we, you know, the first engine we had in this, we pulled the heads and banks at 150, they were leaking coolant. I mean, it's, it's been problematic, but we, I think the guys at uh, Vintage V12s have worked on this. I mean, I, I don't know of anybody else in the world that can really overhaul one right now, but they've made all the molds for the seals and everything. And right now, you know, knock on wood, this new engine, I mean, there wasn't a leak all the way from Colorado, which is really amazing it's because that has never happened with this airplane. So I think they've done nine engines after this one was restored, and I, this was kind of the test engine. So now the new one's in here, and it's, it's pretty fantastic. It's, it's, it's more durable than a Merlin because of the cam setups and all that kind of stuff. When the uh, British Pacific Fleet equipped itself, uh, when the British Pacific Fleet equipped itself, um, few of these, but mostly they used Corsairs and Hellcats and Avengers. How did this compare with the American-built aircraft, um, not only operated by the uh, United States Navy, but also by the Royal Navy, in terms of uh, performance and capability? You know, like I told you before, they, they brought the uh, Firefly back to Pax River. And I, don't know if you, I can't remember the name of the book, but it, it's a whole series of tests that they did with every aircraft. I talked to Eric Brown at length, who was, and I think you guys know who he was. You know, he's had more carrier landings than anybody ever, and he just died a couple of years ago. He was at 96 years of age, and he was really a great guy. And I asked him, I said, what do you, what do you think? And he compared it very favorably with like, it was like Hellcat. And it shot down a lot of Oscars on the way, you know, they did all the Jimas, you know, Ichijima, Chichijima, all, you know, all on its way up to Japan. So how many, how many were operational in, in uh, the Pacific at that time? Do you have any idea? Oh, I have no idea. You know, it's, you'd have to read the history, and they brought, I remember which squadrons went there, and they were on a number of carriers. And then, in, like I said, in Korea, then it turned into a ground attack airplane. That's why the invasion stripes were on it, because there were uh, other propeller airplane there, but they were yaks, and so they didn't want the jets to shoot them down. And so that's why you see the invasion stripes on the airplane. And they're from Korea. Next. Over here. Okay. Just a question. Uh, why is there a shield on the uh, port exhaust stacks? Oh, there's a shield on both sides. And those are basically flash hiders for night flying. So, because uh, the flames will just blind you. So, they, they, you can't see them when, with the flash hiders on there. Captain Eddie, tell us about your travels to find parts for the airplane during the restoration time. Where did, where did you have to go to get the parts? Well, basically, once, once I bought the airplane, you know, I, I saw the thing and it was, I go, you know, this is an undervalued thing, you know what I mean? People don't know what it is in the U.S. They've never seen it before. 
you know, the Canadians had theirs, and it, and theirs, you know, was tragically lost in 77. So I figured, you know what, now's the time to buy stuff. So, I mean, I traveled all over the world to buy everything. Um, I had flown on exchange with Royal Australian Navy guys they, that were in the U.S. Navy with me. And so the Royal Australian Navy has a historic flight. And their, their historic flight operated an S-2, a Firefly. They've got a Sea Fury, Iroquois helicopter. They, and the reserves flew those airplanes to their air shows. We don't have, you know, Britain has the same thing with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight where they have, you know, active duty and reserve guys fly those airplanes. We don't have anything like that here. I mean, this is all private individuals. So what happened was everybody goes, oh, well, you can trust this guy because we've flown with him. We know him. And what would ever be the strange fate that I would end up with an airplane from Australia. So basically they had a lot of the spares I needed and I had all the spares they needed. So we traded all this stuff back and forth. And of course you're dealing with the government, so it's hard. And that all happened. And then I traveled, someone saw an article about me in Smithsonian, I'll give you a couple of just quick stories. And he had a bunch of Griffin engine stuff. He said, he just, somebody, the Smithsonian called me and they said, hey, this guy wants to email you. And I said, yeah, go ahead and email, let him, I don't care. So he goes, I have a bunch of stuff that you want. And I go, what do you have? And he goes, I have all this Griffin stuff. And I go, how'd you get that? And he goes, he didn't say. So basically, <laughs> basically traveled to Cyprus. And there's a base there called RAF Akateri. And that they flew the Shackleton bombers out of there. And so some Greek Cypriot guy, I mean, I must have been kind of crazy, but he bought two of the Shackleton bombers. And what came with the Shackleton bombers were 16 containers of spares. And so he defaulted on the, I mean, I, there's just no way you'd have money to take care of any of this stuff, right? So, you know, the last Shackleton is here in the U.S. It's at Pima Air Museum. And so I can use the heads and banks off of those engines, of the 58s. And so he had 52 boxes of brand new overhauled 58 heads and banks. So I got, I got to have that stuff, right? So I traveled to Cyprus, and the guy turned out to own a salvage company, the largest salvage ships in the Mediterranean. He's the guy that carried the Russian Mir submarines to dive on the Titanic. So that's just one guy. The Spinner and Cowles, they were, cru they were wrecked. You know, they were on an airplane that had crashed. And so a friend of mine in Australia said, I know where there's a set of spinner, there's a spinner and some cowls. Because the mechanic said, well, it's going to cost like 50,000 bucks to make a spinner. And I'm going, no, that doesn't sound good. So they're on the wall of a bar. I go, where's the bar? And they go, we have no idea. So, so six months later, he calls me, he goes, I found the bar. It's in Melbourne. So we flew an air show we're in Tasmania. And then on the way back, we said, well, let's go to Melbourne and we'll look at it. And sure enough, there it is up on the wall of the bar. I mean, it painted with shark's teeth and it had like a little picture of a firefly next to it. And I go, I got to have this stuff. So we talked to um, the bar. They go, we're not going to sell it. It's an integral part of our decor. I go, okay. Oh, that sucks. So six months later, I get a call. Guess what? The bar's on leased land. They're building the convention center. The bar has to be torn down. I go, oh, good. So he goes, Every, everything is up for auction. So in between the ladies' soap dispensers and the men's urinals was a thing called the bomb aimer nose. And the bomb aimer nose is this spinner and these cowls. And so my friend said, I said, can you go bid on it? He goes, no, I can't. I got a cell phone. I got another guy that's going to do that. So I call up at the end. I said, wait, I got to have it. I mean, I don't care what it costs, but don't tell the auction people because they'll just raise the price on me and that'll kill me, right? I mean, they could make a trillion dollars off of me. So long story longer, he calls me up. I said, good news and bad news. And I said, what's the good news? He goes, or bad news. He goes, my cell phone died halfway through the auction. I go, oh, it's not good. I said, what's the good news? He goes, you have the bomb aimer nose. He goes, but you paid more for that than anything in the auction. How much did I pay? He goes, $1,500 Australian, which is like 1000 bucks." I go, oh. <laughs> so then he said, well, you know, we, the Navy can't pick it up for you. But I have a guy that's going to take care of it over there. So we're just going to put it in his warehouse. So a year later, good news and bad news. The bomb aimer nose is at, at the Naval Air Station, NARA, which is south of Sydney. But it's all damaged. He said the, the spinner's crushed, the cowls are all scratched up. I go, well, it didn't look like that on the wall, so we don't know who did it. The guy that stored it or were the workmen taken off the, off the wall or whatever. He goes, good news and bad news. We have a guy here that can fix it, but you have to buy him a microwave for their shop. I said, okay, here's the microwave. 
So he fixes it all up. It gets shipped to Colorado. Good news and bad news. The bomb aimer knows it's here, but the forklift tines went through the box. I go, oh, no, you got to be kidding me. So it got restored one more time, and then a friend of mine tells me two years later there was a Made for Australia TV show that was on, and somebody was going to attack and kill the prime minister. you got to remember this is a show. And they opened up the container. They, they were smuggling an F-4 into, this is a TV show, right? They're smuggling an F-4 in a 40-foot container to attack the prime minister. And he said when they opened the container up, he goes, guess what was in the container? I go, what was in the container? He goes, the bomb aimer knows. <laughs> so that's just one part. Was that the hardest part to get? <laughs> no, no, that was. Well, what was the hardest was, part? I don't know. I mean, it's. I mean, the engine stuff. Every. I mean, everything is hard. I mean, nothing is easy. And 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 the problem is, but you, all of you guys out here that restore airplanes and do everything, you know, this is all British, right? So it's not metric, it's not an. It's all British. And so the hardware is extremely expensive. And, the, like, the screws, the thread pitches are different. The, the angles of the heads are all different. And so you have to buy everything from England or some Commonwealth country. And this stuff, since eBay has arrived, it's good and bad. Because a lot of this stuff is sitting on people's shelves. Oh, I got a Firefly part at home, and it's sitting on my shelf, and it's like something I need, right? And so the airplane that crashed, that went up on the pole in Griffith. That's still up there. And you know what? That's like all, all the spare parts are sitting up on that pole. <laughs> it's like I want those things. Um, which wing oh. is from 1948? Well, I don't know. You'd have to come over here and look at it. You can come look and see what the little tag says. I'm not sure which one it is. But you know how we found that out is we were putting a bunch of bolts in it, and they didn't fit. And I go, you ordered, you know, I mean, these things were high-strength bolts. And I said, you ordered all this stuff. I can't believe you've ordered stuff that doesn't fit. And he goes, the two wings are different. And that's how we figured it out. Uh, relating to the parts that you've purchased, what do you think your total cost is for restoring this airplane? Oh, uh, we'll just say it's a lot. <laughs> oh, and my other, and then just my other comment, Steve, your uh, museum in Hamilton is fabulous. Yep. It's a couple of Mustangs worth. Good Mustangs. <laughs> Is there a reason the British engines turn the wrong way compared to the American engines? I think it's the same reason why they drive on the wrong side of the road. I, I, <laughs> but you know what? Someone pointed out to me once. They said, you know, in the Navy airplanes, it actually works out pretty good because... You know, you're, you're always flying a left pattern, right? So as you come through the 90, if you get slow and you stall the airplane, which way does it roll? It's going to roll to the right. So it's going to roll more upright. What's a U.S. plane do? It rolls to the left and it goes right in. So, And you can see pictures. up. They have a lot of, if you guys go online, you can look. You know, guys getting in close wave-offs, and because it does turn the wrong way, the airplane goes to the right. There's a picture of one of these sticking out of the funnel on one of the carriers. I mean, it flew right into the island. I think you said that this was a radar, and the radar operator was back there. So the radar is gone. What is the back seat for? He's just a navigator then. And, and in fact, you know what? They, they even took him. He was a, a navigator for the whole time in Korea, but there were always two guys in the airplane. And in fact, when it towed targets, he was the guy that got to stuff the target out through that chute that's on the bottom. Anyone else? We've got some time here. Yeah, right here. Just put it right up against each other. This is just a general question, but can you tell me who the commentator was on the film that we watched before you guys came up? David Hartman. By the way, David will be here starting tomorrow afternoon and be here through Saturday. Could you tell us what the prop diameter is? 14.9. So it's supposedly the biggest prop that was ever put on a British fighter. Is there someone else? Well, thanks for coming, folks. But we have also, for you veterans, we have a challenge coin here, and it's from 
Fagan Fighters World War II Museum, and it's uh, it'll be available. I don't know where Kyle is right now. She'll be running out here in a minute. Here she is, the lady, the pretty lady with a little straw hat, and she's got that for your veterans. And I want to kind of promote the Warbirds now. Uh, you don't have to be own a Warbird to be a member of the Warbirds. As a matter of fact, most of us members do not own Warbirds uh, for numerous reasons. <laughs> but we, we would love to have you as a member. Uh, we have a Warbird building over here on our left. It also has our, all our merchandise. It's got numerous books and uh, it's got Bud Anderson's books in there. There's a lot of them in there that, that if you have an aviation library, you should look around at that thing. And also we want to promote flyingtv.com. They're the ones that are filming this and it's live streamed now and it's going all over the world. You can wave now and see your mother can see you. And thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it.